let's get back on track and think more about the, how gerontology came to be. So gerontology wouldn't exist if it weren't for the National Institutes of Health. The National Institutes of Health is a uh, research institute created by the U.S. federal government and funded by the U.S. Congress. It gets, uh, they spend over $28 billion a year on medical research and this concept of government funded research really began in 1887 uh, when uh, it was noticed that there was lots of communicable diseases that were being imported to the United States from foreigners or within the United States and um, the government decided let's study ways to improve the health of the population. Let's cut down on these communicable diseases. So it began with just a few scientists in working in uh, Staten Island, New York and has gradually expanded now. Now, uh, National Institutes of Health has over 18,000 employees. Some of those people do research directly through what we call intramural research. And in intramural research, the um, NIH hires the top scientists in the field and uh, they do uh, kind of the research of their choice. Uh, there's a researcher I hope to introduce you to later in the course named Luigi Ferrucci, who works at the National Institutes of Health and uh, direct some research studies there. Uh, they also have extramural research, extramural funding. And that means that they fund other people to do research. So here at the Leonard Davis School, we often uh, apply uh, for uh, research funding. We come up with a, a long proposal of what study we want to do, and we tell a very detailed description of how we're going to do it. And we request a fixed budget, and uh, it's reviewed by scientists, and if selected, uh, then that funding helps pay a portion of the professor's salary and pays for most of the administrative staff and uh, a lot of our doctoral students are funded by that kind of research. Right. But this concept began in 1887. That was the point I wanted to make. So 1887, government started funding health research and that was really the first groundwork for opening up the doors to gerontology. The term gerontology itself was coined in 1903 by Eli Mechnikov. Mechnikov was a Russian scientist who uh, was interested in older people and uh, he's published an article where he said that uh, he, he wanted to define this field as the study of old men. Geron, which is Greek for old man, and ology. Now, uh, ology means study of. Now, okay, this is 2008. We don't just concentrate on old men anymore. Uh, in fact, we don't even concentrate just on people. Gerontology is now broadly defined as the general study of aging, and it can be the aging in any uh, organism. So, uh, Eli Meshnikov had an interesting perspective. Uh, he thought that aging was related to the immune system in some way. And today, we believe that actually he had a point. Aging does seem to be related to the immune system. Uh, we'll get more into that later. It's through in inflama uh, an inflammatory process. But uh, aging and immune function seem inextricably linked. And it was first thought of by Elin Meshnikov. Um, gerontology actually got a head start over geriatrics. Geriatrics wasn't coined until six years later by an American physician, Ignaz Nasher. So, uh, and um, Ignaz Nasher wasn't until 1914 that he published the first book on geriatrics. Uh, so gerontology had quite a head start. But there really wasn't an organized grouping of scientists studying aging until 1945, when 24 scientists got together and created the Gerontological Society of America. Now this organization has grown to over 5,000 members today, including all the professors here at the Leonard Davis School and professors at universities around the world. And the Gerontological Society of America um, supports an annual meeting where scientists gather and discuss the latest research findings. And it gives us a chance to, to meet and greet each other. So we learn about who else is studying the same topic and we can engage in collaborative research. So that process didn't really start until 1945. Uh, in 1957, NIH uh, decided to create its first center for aging research. So as early as 1957, the federal government started paying close attention to the concept of, of aging in research. And in 1961, uh, there was what we call the, the White House Council on Aging, um, White House Conference on Aging, I apologize. So 
the White House Conference on Aging uh, was a chance to bring together experts who study aging and discuss what the government can do to support the needs of an older population, what programs would be helpful, what, uh, what issues might come up. And so this was the first time uh, that the government sponsored kind of a conference that would uh, allow people to strategize uh, how to address the needs of an aging population. Ten years later, there was a second White House Council, uh, White House Conference on Aging, and that at that meeting it was proposed we need an official National Institute on Aging, a larger organization than the original Center for Aging that was started at NIH. So. Um, the, these White House uh, conferences on aging have had an important impact on policies. And I put a link to the 2005 White House Conference on Aging in our course readings because uh, that was the most recent meeting. And you can see some of their proposals and get an idea of what the next step might be in policies towards older people through that. So uh, uh, in 1976, uh, a professor, Dr. Robert Butler, was became the first director of the National Institute on Aging. And Robert Butler's name will come up again and again in this course. He's uh, been a great innovator uh, in the field, uh, as well as uh, Nathan Schock, who um, was the first scientific director of NIA. Uh, he's published a lot of the early studies on disability and aging, and uh, we'll talk about him more in next week's lectures. And uh, a lot of our understanding of the science behind aging research uh, is actually relatively recent that uh, it's been published. Uh, so for example, in 1993, we have the first evidence of a genetic mutation that can have a dramatic impact on life expectancy. It's in worms, but it's a fascinating concept that uh, one gene mutation can, uh, can double lifespan in one species of worms, C. elegans. So, uh, aging research has come a long ways since its early days, and uh, it's hard to imagine where it might go from here. Uh, and so uh, uh, we look forward to seeing what happens.